all our Asian guests and good evening to the New Zealand guests and good morning to the Europeans and even good night to the Americans, but I actually hope that they are sleeping instead of being so busy. We are very welcome to this webinar that we have organized from Wageningen University out together with International Dairy Federation and CCAFs. I will introduce CCAFs in a few minutes. My name is Jelle Zijlstra. I'm working for Wageningen Livestock Research as a dairy economist. And next to that, I'm a project leader of an international CCAFs project about upscaling mitigation options for the dairy sector. I prepared this webinar together with Maria Sanchez of International Dairy Federation IDF, and we will introduce her in a, in a minute. This, uh, web this webinar is part of uh, a project we at Wageningen University did for CCAFs. Can I have the next slide, please? And this project is about uh, reducing of greenhouse gas emissions from the dairy sector in Asia. We had uh, two different projects in two different countries together with local partners in this country. One project in China about large scale farms and another project in Indonesia about small scale farms, small holder farms, I have to call them. And the results of this project will be presented by my colleague Marion de Vries later in this webinar. So this is where we collaborated with CCAFs. CCAFs is an international organization on research on climate change, agriculture, and food security. Can I have the next slide, please? And the next slide is about the introduction of International Dairy Federation that has been a, a wonderful partner in preparing this. We love, we love to prepare it with International Dairy Federation and like to execute it with them because they have a a wonderful network and they are also very dedicated to making the dairy sector more sustainable. Please Maria introduce yourself and in IDF. Thank you very much Jelle and nice to meet you all of you. Uh, so thanks to Wageningen University and uh, CGR to propose IDF to join this webinar. Uh, I'm just gonna say very briefly that we also have now a very exciting project we are updating the LCA guide that was uh, um, published in 2015. Uh, the project is actually led by one of our participants today. I think Brian Lindsay is there. So I am sure if you have questions, he can answer it to you. So the update has been uh, done now. We, we already have a draft and the, the action team that is looking at this, it co is composed of 38 member experts and we represent actually the different geographies, 17 different geographies, and I believe there's also some representatives from Asia. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for them to learn about doing LCAs and uh, in the same way that we are doing at the IDF. And then it's like a very important discussion forum um, among the scientists to, to agree on the different um, need, needs that we have to update. There's like different points that we have been discussing about. So I'm just gonna tell you this is gonna come in uh, quarter two of 2022. So we will keep you posted. Uh, and with that, Jale, I pass over to you. I pass you to the next, next slide. Thanks again. And the next slide is about this webinar. Uh, like I mentioned, we like to present the results from our Indonesian project. But uh, when considering to present these, we we're thinking about, okay, we might as well uh, try to share experience from other countries also, because there are a lot of experience already in Southeast Asia with mitigation options in the dairy sector. And we like to hear from other projects as well. And I'm very glad and very grateful to the many local experts that are now present here in this webinar to present. And they all uh, were very enthusiastic to share their experience as well. So I really love to have them on board. What we will do, we'll, we, we will discuss experience with mitigation options. That's our main, our main reason to organize it. But of course, we can also discuss about bottlenecks and opportunities you have in the different countries. Uh, we would like to hear some about national or local plans to reduce greenhouse gases in the future. And some of the speakers will also bring in research results. 
Um, I, I, I once again, uh, thank you very much for all the presenters to join in this webinar. Can I have a next slide, please? These are the presenters we have today. The first three presenters are international presenters talking about the Asian wide issues on greenhouse gases and what is going on in all kinds of mitigation action programs in the different countries. And after that, we have the speakers from all the individual countries. Uh, I'd like to mention that we all have only time slots of 10 minutes. That's very short. And it's not enough to explain everything what's going on. But I hope these 10 minute slots make the whole program very attractive. And in case you want to know more about these topics, feel free to approach any of the speakers to share your questions about any of any item that you would like to know more about. And we will share all the email addresses of all the speakers. So one of the goals of this webinar is also to have more international sharing of experiences and knowledge dissemination. So I hope after this webinar, it's easier to find colleague experts who are working on the same Topic, greenhouse gases in the dairy sector. We have a full line of speakers. We start with three international speakers and the local speakers after that. And I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Montgomery as a first speaker. Please introduce yourself. And I hope that you can share your experience on greenhouse gas emissions in the dairy sector with our audience. Mr. Montgomery, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning from me in Uruguay, where I'm based. I'll share my screen. Um, hopefully that's coming through. So my name is Hayden Montgomery. I am the special representative of the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. And I'm going to very quickly give you a bit of an overview of the work that the GRA does, um, predominantly in livestock. And I've tried to pick some examples that relate uh, to dairy to show you today. But it's going to be a quick tour, but it, hopefully it will provide enough of the, an insight into what we do so that, as, as you've said, any questions we can, we can follow up later. First of all, um, to say what the GRA is, we are a 65 member country uh, virtual organization working across all of agricultural production systems. And we work through different research groups that are led by our member countries. And we have partnerships with uh, international, regional and other organizations that you can see on the right of the screen uh, with their logos. Uh, and with those partners, we uh, try to establish uh, active collaborations in whatever form makes sense for the, for the partner in question. Some you will see are multilateral financial institutions, others are technical platforms, other partners are different initiatives or UN bodies. So you can imagine the work we do is quite diverse depending on the nature of that partner. Just to focus on the livestock research group, one of the four, um, this is the, uh, the mission of the livestock group, which is to link global science and build global science capability to reduce the emissions intensity of livestock production systems. The way the livestock research group organizes itself is to focus its work through these five networks that are on the, on the top right of the slide. Uh, and each of those networks has a very active community uh, and a coordinator that tries to promote scientific collaboration uh, identify priority research areas so that the GRA community can, um, or my role as well, try to um, find resources to ensure those priorities can be delivered. Um, the last two meetings of the Livestock Research Group have taken place in a virtual format, and that has been a silver lining because we have now a lot of material on the websites that you can see there on the screen for both the 2020 and the 2021 meeting which just just took place in the last few weeks and on there you'll have on-demand presentations about all of the work of the groups invited presentations and you can see the whole meetings in fact um, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, complete video coverage of those meetings so i encourage you to explore those websites if you have interest um, in terms of some of the work that is done across the groups, I just want to give you an, an overview of, you know, the, the, the very, uh, I guess, fundamental science that has been done, some of the training work that we're doing, some of the work with industry, just to give you a kind of a, a sense of the diversity of things that we try and do. So this is just one example of a project that was conducted through the livestock group. 
uh, Rumen Microbial Genomics Network, and it was a global census to try and understand the uh, diversity of microorganisms within the rumen of uh, different livestock species around the world. Uh, this was a huge study and um, was able to inform us, which we didn't know before, that the uh, main methane producing uh, organisms are very, very similar, irrespective of the type of livestock species and their location. So that was a very useful information to have to target um, mitigation interventions. So this is a very good example of the sort of science projects we try to do. Many partners, lots of data, try and shift the agenda forward with new knowledge. In terms of working with industry and trying to um, provide uh, guidance on best practice, um, this is an example of work we did with the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative um, some years ago now, but it's, I would say, more or less current in terms of its state of knowledge. Um, probably the only thing that I would update in this slide would be that inhibitors, which were in this uh, study in the proof of concept phase, have certainly moved further along the, the chain of an innovation, and we see some inhibitors very close to commercialization today. But the idea of this was to basically say, what do we know? At what stage are these different options in terms of their development? What would be available today? And then some of the sort of discussion about co-benefits, economic uh, benefits, um, other environmental considerations, etc., to try and provide guidance to, to uh, policymakers, to scientists, to the farming community about what might be viable in their different systems. Uh, as a kind of follow on from that in some ways, we, we also focused on some particular areas. This was an example of a study we did to look at this connection between improving animal health and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, in this case, dairy systems. This is a study we did with the Global Dairy Platform and Dairy Sustainability Framework. Brian's probably still on the call. He was uh, one of the drivers behind this with us. And this is a study we looked at um, three types of animal health intervention in three different geographies to look at what the benefits would be for reducing greenhouse gases and also the economic benefits, of course, which would be what would be driving farmers' behavior. And it showed that in all cases, improving animal health made sense, both from an environmental and an economic perspective. This is a current piece of work we're doing. This is with the global dairy sector, including IDF, Global Dairy Platform, and other partners. And the role of the GRA in this is to be a um, knowledge partner and provide some analytical support along with the FAO to um, undertake analysis to support the ambition of the dairy sector. So basically, we're looking to model mitigation across different dairy systems. And this is not published work in any way. This is just uh, to give you a sense of the, the methodology. But basically, we'll have to identify uh, types of dairy systems globally. This is, these are six that are provided by FAO, but there will be more, presumably. Uh, and the idea is identifying the greenhouse gas footprints of these different systems in terms of the composition of uh, emissions uh, that make up the total footprint, the sources, and then identify mitigation options that would be most relevant to those different sources in those different types of production systems. So you can imagine, you know, a very different mitigation approach in pastoral agropastoral systems than you would in a say a high input high output confined system and that will come through as we do the analysis and, and work, work through this initiative. In terms of um, one of the biggest challenges facing um, or barriers I guess to mitigation it's our ability to monitor and measure greenhouse gases in, in agricultural systems and so we've placed a lot of effort to try to improve the way that we quantify greenhouse gases both in terms of field measurements, and we've provided lots of guideline, guidance and guidelines to scientists to ensure that measurements are done in a high quality, but also taking that information and turning it into something more policy relevant or relevant to farmers, which is what we would call, I guess, MRV, right? Or greenhouse gas inventories to support uh, nationally determined contributions or other policies. And we've provided lots of um, resources working with partners like FAO, like CCAFs that was mentioned earlier, uh, Unique there as well as one of our one of our strong partners, um, to provide guidance to policymakers, to others about how you compile information, how do you have the methodologies that can capture changes in performance within livestock systems, um, as I say, so we can improve our ability to monitor and measure and therefore improve uh, or accelerate action. Another role we have is to kind of connect different regions together and try to find ways to mobilize resources. Um, so we have worked a lot within the European Union context to join competitive calls with GRA as a funder, which is basically funds provided by some of our members to support, in this case, developing country institutions to be involved in this European call. This is just, just one that's just closed now. And I just highlighted the projects here that include uh, GRA um, supported uh, participants from Latin America, um, 
uh, in many cases from, from Africa, in this case Kenya, from South Africa. And these projects relate to the issue of circularity between livestock and cropping systems. So it was a very satisfying example of, of how we have been able to connect scientists across different regions, north, south, etc. The other thing we focus a lot of attention on is building the capability of early career scientists. This is one of our flagship programs called CliffGrads. I think we have maybe one, at least one CliffGrads uh, alumni on this call. Um, we've worked with CCAF to deliver this and already we've delivered 124 scholarships to PhD students from developing countries to focus uh, on improving their knowledge uh, in greenhouse gas measurement and mitigation. Another example of that is a partnership with the Roo Forum, which is, uh, in fact, uh, today in a few hours, we'll be having this uh, continued series with Roo Forum, where we will be presenting work that our um, uh, master's level graduate research grants are doing. You can see the topics on the right, uh, the countries in which that work is undertaken, universities. Um, and again, this is a really uh, important program of ours to, to reach right back into master's level to bring those um, scientists through to be our future science leaders in, uh, in greenhouse gas mitigation. So if you're interested, please please jump into this event that'll be coming in, in a few hours. Uh, so that's a very quick overview. Um, more information can be found on our website. Um, my email is on this presentation there on the bottom as well. So have no, no hesitations in contacting me if you have any questions, clarification, I'm more than happy to, to follow up. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Montgomery. A wonderful overview of what is done. And there's a lot done in the global world. World, That's quite clear. The next speaker is Pierre Gerber from World Bank. Yep. You hear me? Yes, very clear. Very good. Hello, uh, my name is Pierre Graber. I'm a senior agricultural economist at the World Bank. I can you see the presentation well? Can I move on? You're fine? We, we can see the presentation. Yeah, okay, yes, very good. All right, very good. Um, so, so um, as Hayden, uh, I, I took a, a little bit of a global perspective and a whole livestock perspective uh, uh, in my talk. Um, you know, whether you look at the UN or international forums, uh, the World Bank, the media, clearly climate change is high on the agenda. Uh, and, and also very clearly, uh, the livestock sector is increasingly pointed out uh, as a place where really action needs to take place in, to, in, in terms of uh, mitigation of emissions and adaptation also. And, and so for the World Bank, it's clear that we cannot invest in the sector as we did decades ago, right? Business as usual is not going to work anymore. Um, so so the, the way uh, we approach the livestock sector and its, its place in sustainable food system is along these three areas. Healthy people, so that's the, the contribution of, of livestock to diets, micronutrients in particular, the contribution of the sector to, uh, to food safety, prevention of zoonosis, of uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, uh, the second area is the health of the planet, the environment, clearly, uh, mitigation of potential uh, in, the, in the sector, sustainable land management, particularly for pasture, but also for feed crops, uh, pollution control, with regard to manure management, to uh, drug residues. Uh, and the third area is healthy economies, right? looking at how the sector contributes uh, to the assets of the poor, especially the poorest uh, segment of the population in, in low-income countries, how it also contributes to economic growth in rural areas, and important paper uh, uh, he, the, the, the sector uh, can play uh, in gender equality uh, for youth and, and women in terms of jobs, in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, so, so that's the, the, the perception we have, or the kind of perception we, we, we place around the livestock sector. It is not new. Uh, this is something uh, that is uh, thought about and, and conceptualized at the bank since a couple of decades. But clearly, uh, this is getting more and more traction as uh, the context, uh, the general context is changing. Um, so, despite you know stagnation, uh, especially for beef, for example, in some areas of Western Europe, you can see that the expectation. Uh, is that the, the, the livestock sector is going to continue growing, um, even you know, under sustainability scenarios. So, so that is calling for more investment 
investment in production assets, in policies, uh, in research, training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, so that means also that more and more countries are actually coming to the World Bank Group, uh, the, the, the branch working with the governments, but also the branch working with private sector for loans uh, in that area. And, and here it really is, is the question for us, how do we respond to this request while at the same time taking that opportunity to, to uh, bring the sector on, on a more sustainable path? So, so looking really, of course, only at, at climate here, but there are other dimensions that we look at. Uh, here are kind of uh, five corporate requirements, five uh, uh, commitments that the bank makes in, in any uh, development of a new operation to mainstream uh, climate adaptation and mitigation in the design and implementation. First, there is a, a risk analysis. So how is climate change going to pose a risk to the investment? Second, GIG account. So there is a, an ex ante assessment of the impact of the investment of emissions uh, among beneficiaries. Third, the result from the GIG accounting is used in the economic analysis of the operation. So, so we look at the uh, public benefit, if you want, of that operation, including the reduction of GIG emissions. Fourth, we look uh, for each dollar invested, whether it generates co-benefit in terms of mitigation or adaptation. So if I invest in feed and feed has a uh, uh, feed quality and nutrition and it has an effect on mitigation, then I say that that investment generated co-benefit in terms of uh, And fifth, uh, we now have regularly in our, our operations some indicators that allow us to monitor really during implementation the effect of what has been invested. Um, so so uh, this is uh, the, the, the way the portfolio looks like. As I said, a growing sector, therefore growing investment, and you can see that here uh, uh, the portfolio is growing. You can see uh, at the bottom left uh, where we're investing. The two first regions are in Africa, East and West. And then the, third, uh, the, the three next regions, East Asia and Pacific, South Asia, uh, Europe and Central Asia are all uh, kind of associated with Asia. So, so there is, you see a large part of the portfolio in Asia. Uh, and importantly, you see that uh, on average, 61% of our investment that generate those climate change co benefits are just uh, And this is higher actually than, uh, than what we have for the ad portfolio, and it's also increasing. So, so we're able to better mainstream uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, the entry points we follow for uh, mitigation, uh, I don't want to go too much into details here. I'm sure there's going to be covered many more uh, detailed and nuanced uh, by the, the forthcoming speakers, but we go where we have level of certainty that we will reach effect, right? And we will also go where we know there is return on investment. So it's around efficiency, it's around carbon sequestration in rangelands, and it's about energy use efficiency, and for example, in cooling, renewable, etc. Right? So, so those are the broad approaches that we, uh, we work around and we tailor and we adapt to the consider. Importantly, for an organization such as the, as the World Bank, uh, oh, sorry, um, that, that is a financial institution, so which really look at the return on investment, uh, you see that there is no contradiction or there is no exclusion between a high level of co-benefits or a high level of, of climate change benefits and financial and economic profitability of these operations. So here you have four operations in Asia, South, East, uh, Central. <clears throat> you see on the right-hand side uh, that they generate substantial level of co-benefits. Uh, and But you see that both at the financial internal rate of return, so which is the profit profitability for the private sector, or at the economic internal rate of return, which is the uh, benefit if you want, of the society as a whole when externalities uh, are, are factored in, there is a, a very substantial uh, economic rationale for investing in, in these operations. So, so that is uh, very important to us and very important, of course, to the countries that borrow from us. Um, the, the science around uh, uh, adaptation mitigation is, is a, is a is a very rapidly evolving field. Uh, so the collaboration with uh, groups like uh, the CCAVs, uh, like the GRA, like uh, Wageningen University is extremely important, obviously. 
uh, and and also what is evolving very rapidly is our practice about uh, mainstreaming the changes in the systems. So um, to help our teams uh, who are on the ground and who are mainly not specialized in that area but need to know something about it, we have developed this uh, this guide, uh, investing in sustainable guide, uh, which you can browse here. And, and really, the idea is is it is a point where we try to simplify and organize knowledge around uh, sustainability in the livestock sector. Uh, we have a, a health, com uh, an environmental component, sorry, a health component, and we're gonna add an equity component. Uh, and it's really uh, a, a, an entry point, if you want to know that, if you want that uh, clarifies the concept uh, and, and provide direct guidance to those who uh, design and support uh, operations. We also uh, look at new ways to incentivize uh, investment uh, in mitigation, uh, in, and in particular through climate finance. Uh, this is a report that we released earlier this year. If you're interested, uh, take a look. Uh, feel, feel free to reach out um, separately. We'll be happy to discuss about it. Um, so, last slide. <clears throat> what are the lessons right, uh, through, throughout this experience? First, we really need to help the clients. So here, the clients are countries. Uh, turn uh, the high-level commitments to sustainability and climate change uh, into practical action. Right? We, we see now that uh, through the NDCs, uh, there is uh, uh, ownership uh, at the country level uh, of mitigation targets. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture is aware of them, know that they have to do something with it, but how? Right? And, and so build the confidence that it can be done uh, proposing analysis of current situations, uh, helping uh, uh, the countries assess options, provide technical assistance. This is all extremely important when it comes to really putting those targets or putting the plans and the roadmap in, in, in motion to reach those targets. Uh, second, uh, aligning intervention. Whoever uh, here is, is, is uh, familiar with uh, uh, agriculture, um, sector and, and investment in agriculture know how it is complicated to change practices and technology to in incentivize changes in practices. So really we need to align incentives, extension services, realignment of public support, uh, issues like access to land, all around that, that objective of practice change. Otherwise we really do not get traction on the on the third uh, area uh, is the necessity to measure results. This is a new area, there are doubts, uh, um, and we also still need to learn what is working, what is not working. So building the evidence, uh, uh, putting emphasis on monitoring and evaluation in our operations is extremely important. It is also, of course, important if you want to reach out to new forms of, uh, of uh, incentives, such as climate fund. And finally, uh, importantly, uh, take advantage of the diversity of species, breeds, feed resources, management practices uh, that, that we find that are in presence uh, uh, in the countries where, where we invest. Make sure that we really tap in, 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 in that potential to, to find the, the best solution, if you want, to those three main areas that, that I mentioned before, the healthy people, the healthy climate, and the healthy economies. Uh, they all have, in different ways, uh, things to offer and, and places where we can improve. So that is really critical to, uh, to build on that experience. Thank you very much. Pierre, thank you very much for showing us how World Bank has integrated greenhouse gas reduction in its programs together with aligning with other sustainability issues and economic goals. Thanks for that. The next speaker is uh, Mrs. Anna Motet of FAO. Please, Mrs. Motet, introduce yourself and explain what you will share with us about greenhouse gas mitigations. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela. Good morning, everyone. Um, and it's it's good to, to see so many people connected and, and some familiar names. Um, so um, I was asked to prepare something about ongoing and planned projects on greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, in livestock in dairy uh, in the region of Asia. So that's what I tried to do, but uh, I'm not going to call it an overview, uh, if you allow me, because uh, I don't think uh, I would have had the capacity to, to um, uh, map everything that's happening at the moment. But just let's say a, a quick snapshot. Um, Pierre mentioned 
the NDCs. And before we look into uh, those projects that, uh, that I listed, uh, just a, a few elements from the analysis that we did in the region with our colleagues from the, the regional office in Bangkok uh, of the NDCs. And you see here the type of uh, mitigation policies and measures uh, in agriculture that were listed by countries. Um, first, the, the, what, what, what we realize is that livestock is, is, is quite present uh, in all of the sub-regions uh, in the NDC, in the countries and the CDC. Uh, livestock is mentioned as mitigation uh, uh, between the, in between 60, sorry, 56 percent of the countries in Southern Asia, up to 80 percent in Eastern Asia. So it's it's quite uh, recognized as a as a key entry point. Sorry for the background noise. I hope that's okay. Um, you can still hear me. So it's 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 identified as a key entry point for climate change mitigation in the region, uh, and this has to do with the the, the very high presence of livestock uh, in all types of agroecosystems, uh, from pastoral systems to mixed systems in the lowlands or in the uplands uh, in the region. Um, so we, we, we see that uh, in, in average 68% of countries include at least uh, one mitigation measure on livestock in NDCs. And you see here the kind of, of uh, technical uh, entry points they're considering. So general livestock management is one, but uh, you see that they're mentioning specifically breeding and husbandry feeding and manure management. Manure management being the one that is the most often mentioned in terms of technical entry point for livestock mitigation. Um, you, we also have uh, some actual examples uh, in, 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 in a number of countries of mitigation policies and measures in livestock. So you see, for example, in terms of specific to livestock, uh, the top part of this slide, Pakistan, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Bhutan have uh, already uh, started to implement uh, mitigation policies and actions. So you see, for example, if you look at Vietnam, uh, the distribution of specific types of feed, uh, molasses, urea uh, in dairy cattle, um, in Afghanistan, uh, the work on a biogas system, developing biogas for uh, manure management uh, and recycling energy and nutrients. Uh, when you look at uh, grasslands and pastures, you see also some ongoing existing policies in Afghanistan, China and Bhutan again. Uh, so if you look at uh, China, for example, uh, they are working on promoting mechanisms of maintaining the balance between grass and livestock, so the stocking rate uh, adjustments. Uh, but what you can see is that um, in, in most of the cases, uh, there's no uh, associated metric or way to measure uh, actually the, the, the impact of the policies. That, that, uh, that uh, uh, goes back to what Pierre just said uh, in terms of me measurements and MRVs. So for, for this um, kind of snapshot on what's going on in some projects, I, I started with uh, listing all the, the dairy projects that FAO has in the, in the, in the region. Uh, so you see we found uh, uh, upcoming or actually uh, active uh, com uh, sorry, uh, projects in 14 uh, cases. So some, we have three different projects in Bangladesh, for example, uh, two in Pakistan, but uh, in about 10 to 12 countries, we have uh, actually dairy project ongoing. And the one in green are the ones that have a, a climate smart or low carbon livestock development component. Um, so in Afghanistan, in Bangladesh and in Mongolia, uh, in Mongolia, we had a specific climate smart uh, livestock project development. Uh, and I will get back to that. So you see it's in, in a portfolio of an organization like FAO, uh, the climate aspect, especially from the mitigation point of view is really uh, growing and uh, is, is, uh, is representing a, a, a larger part of the portfolio, both in terms of number of countries and budgets. Um, so so I, I, I took a, a number of, uh, of uh, quick uh, snapshots on some projects uh, to, to illustrate uh, how this is happening. So the uh, first one is, is something that has been going on for, for quite a, a number of years already, uh, that is led by the National Dairy Development Board in India. Uh, with a, a very large scale program of uh, improvement of feed balancing in order to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, enteric methane emission, and improve productivity. Um, there were uh, a number of, of monitoring of this project, and we have clear indicators of uh, how much the uh, average income from such projects can uh, increase for small order dairy farmers, 10 to 15%. Uh, the milk production efficiency, which is the 
milk yield per kilogram of dry matter has also been uh, measured and improved uh, and the reduction of enteric methane emissions so uh, 15 to 20 percent reduction so this is this is uh, um, i would say a historical uh, um, work that has been happening in the region in india on, on improving feed quality to reduce emissions and improve productivity i think it's an important one to mention and and then the nddb is is uh, is uh, quite advanced on this aspect um Another one that uh, is, is, I think, uh, uh, important to mention is this project uh, led by FAO uh, with the support of the Climate and Cleaner Coalition um, and, and New Zealand uh, on um, identifying uh, low emission development uh, pathways in a number of countries uh, and production systems in the world. And Bangladesh was one of them. Uh, I put the, the link to the project website here. And uh, there, there was work uh, with also in beef in, in, in South America, in uh, uh, cattle in, in West Africa, but dairy in Bangladesh was, was a, an important one. And you see the type of, uh, again, um, technical improvements that have been considered and, and evaluated in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, cultivation of fodder, improved fodder for, for improved feed, uh, feeding urea and molasses. We already mentioned that, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in India, uh, more balanced feed ration in general, uh, but also some animal health measures like dewarming uh, and some management also on the on, uh, adaptation to climate change with heat stress management that has also impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as uh, you can see both in subsistence dairy systems in blue and commercial dairy systems in green. So you see those measures, they can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sometimes down, like, you know, from uh, for feeding uh, urea and molasses, it can be as uh, high as 36% reduction. Uh, another, and that's a, a completely different story, and we're not talking about dairy anymore, but I thought it, would, it, it was interesting to mention uh, what's happening also in pig production in the region. Uh, and that's, this has to do a lot with uh, recycling uh, manure from, from monogastrics and from pigs in particular, and, and uh, the development of biogas systems. Um, there's this uh, interesting project happening in, in Thailand with the Department of Livestock Development uh, in the context of the Green City project that started in 2015. Uh, the main goal was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uh, air and water pollution from peak production uh, and increase uh, energy efficiency use. And Pierre mentioned this as well. So I'm not going to go through all uh, the different uh, measures that have been implemented to this project, uh, but you see it has to do uh, with, uh, with manure management, but also uh, with feed and animal health. So it's just to, to show to you that whatever the entry point is, uh, you always have some sort of package uh, of, of options and you don't only work on, even if the, if the, if the initial entry point is to reduce uh, pollution and, and, uh, and, and to manage manure better, you always associate this with uh, measures that have to do with feed production or uh, with animal health, for example, in this case. Um, another one, and this is the one that I mentioned, uh, conducted by FAO, uh, which is entitled Piloting the Climate Smart Approach in the Livestock Production Systems in Mongolia. Uh, you see, again, uh, a package of options here that was working on uh, better animal husbandry techniques, improved feeding strategies, uh, but also better feeding during the dry season. And this is uh, particularly important for, uh, uh, I would say, pastoralist systems, nomadic systems to, to uh, look at the, the different seasons, both in terms of feeding, but also when we measure those greenhouse gas emissions, we have very strong um, uh, interannual and intraannual viability to report and to show. And this is something that is still, uh, that still requires some, some, some methodological development uh, in this area. Uh, improved pasture management is obviously very important in, in, in this context. And uh, using uh, the uh, Global Livestock Environmental Assessment Model of FAO, uh, we showed that uh, this project can have a significant uh, impact on greenhouse gas emissions with a reduction uh, that you can see here for all uh, three main gas gases, 21% for methane, 21% for CO2, and 15% for nitrous oxide. And before I finish, I would like also to mention this uh, project that um, that is uh, ongoing between FAO and IFAD in uh, Kyrgyzstan. It's about low carbon and resilient livestock, uh, and it's associated with the NDC revision process there. Um, so this policy brief was just uh, released for, for COP26. 
uh, and uh, it shows uh, the assessment that FAO conducted on behalf of IFAD of the impact of this large-scale dairy project that they have in the country. Um, and the, the project is looking at animal health, but also improved grazing management, feed quality, and the management of reproduction. And uh, we conducted this, this uh, assessment of uh, the impact in terms of uh, carbon co-benefits or climate co-benefits, as we call them. So we see that total emissions, emission intensity, uh, are reducing both uh, with the impact of the project. Uh, protein production is uh, slightly increasing, so we can maintain even increase a little bit production uh, and reduce the feed intake in order to uh, reduce the pressure on the pastures and, and increase uh, um, their uh, carbon storage as well. So to just to conclude now, um, in general, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, what FAO is doing on climate smart livestock or low carbon livestock development in the region. Um, you saw the, the, this example of, of Kyrgyzstan, but this is part of a global program of work of technical assistance of FAO to estimate greenhouse gas emissions from big livestock investments. And we're working on this with the World Bank, uh, with IFAD, but also with the International Funding Corporation, uh, the European Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development. And this includes uh, a lot of, of uh, tools, methods, but also capacity building. Um, there was also a, a, a large uh, training organized by FAO uh, and all uh, FAO country offices and regional office of Bangkok uh, at the end of 2019 on the use of the livestock sector investment and policy toolkit and the use of the uh, online version of the GLEAM model, GLEAMI. Uh, and uh, this uh, took place for 18 countries, which uh, was aiming at uh, improving the, the capacity on, on including livestock in, in livestock, uh, sorry, including climate objectives in livestock projects. And finally, uh, uh, there's a, a, a work that is just starting uh, between our regional office in Bangkok with the, in collaboration with the GRA, which is a scoping work uh, on, um, uh, for developing a work program on climate smart livestock or low carbon livestock in the region, uh, looking at potential investments from GEF or GCF. Uh, and you see the scoping uh, that, is being going, that is going to be conducted with the GRA. Uh, we look at uh, the mitigation and adaptation potential, but also other ecosystem services, um, the potential for innovation, uh, the co-financing potential as well, and the coherence in the region in terms of production systems or trends in the sector. And that will be all. Thank you very much. Well, Mrs. Motel, thank you very much for showing so many projects and so many mitigation options that are applied within these projects. A nice overview about uh, Asian-wide projects. The next speaker is Mrs. Huyong, and she will share with us her experiences with capacity building in Vietnam. Please, Mrs. Huyong, take the floor. I, uh, I am going to share. Uh, the, yeah, enhancing capacity for cattle farmer, technical uh, staff, including greenhouse gas uh, emission in Vietnam livestock production. Content as the uh, introduction of cattle production in Vietnam. The enhancing capacity for uh, cattle uh, farmer technical staff in reducing greenhouse gas emission. Conclusion and transition. The introducing the cattle production in Vietnam. The number of captain um, more than six million. The number of dairy cattle is um, three hundred and thirty-one thousand. Smallholder dairy farm forty-one percent. Run up uh, enhancing capacity for cattle farmer and technical staff in reducing greenhouse gas emission in Vietnam. Uh, cattle raising is a big problem. Uh, emission knowledge uh, about reducing emission uh, and uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, knowledge about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission and it uh, is a technique are uh, still limited. So it is important to raise the awareness uh, flowing activity training, information, dissemination. Objectives uh, of training, 
uh, disseminate information and techniques about greenhouse gas uh, reduction through uh, to, to government extension agent, technical institute, university student, and small medium holder dairy farm. In uh, improve analysis uh, of input to feed recent formulation software for the industry of different ecological area and farm scale. Analyze uh, um, the opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from Vietnamese uh, cotton production. Training participants are uh, cotton farmer and technical staff. Trainer as uh, experts having doctorate degree, professional qualification in the field animal husbandry and veterinary, working at animal husbandry establishment and university research institute. They also have. Uh, pedagogical chicken skin and experience in production practice enthusiastically advising the uh, delegate on nutrition knowledge training content uh, climate change and global warming livestock production and greenhouse gas emission Managing greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, methane and mitigation project, feed and feeding management, menu and management project, nutrition and feed for cattle, animal and husbandry technique um, to reduce emission. Uh, guiding the use of is PC cattle and PC dairy. So, um, Recent uh, formulation software, visiting the racing model and practice um, material from mulching racing or cotton uh, feed to reduce greenhouse gas emission. Training method, uh, grouping blood uh, participants and uh, providing them PC uh, with software. Is to practice directly along with the training section. Flexible uh, application of methods combining many types of the same time, considering around perceiving a participant. Combining uh, with friendship to apply training knowledge to real life practice. Encouraging participants giving feedback on training contents, concerns, and uh, difficult in the uh, reality of animal production in their locality. Result of training. The technical training workshop are benefit uh, and highly appreciated to uh, participants. Most of Participants uh, gain the basic knowledge about climate change and global warming, nutrition, uh, animal feeds. Be able to PC get and PC dairy feed ration formulation software and apply the production for greenhouse gas emission reduction. No basis the, uh, techniques for handling animal waste. Their information collected from experts and participants such as and use the, the actual feed in the garden in Vietnam by region, region and season. Information and this uh, disseminates uh, in propaganda on uh, TPT and TPC website, newspaper, advertisement on US. Uh, USB given to participants and leaflet conclusion. Uh, to raise awareness about livestock production, reduce greenhouse gas emission in farmer and uh, technical of large training practice uh, and information dissemination are still effective. Tip way.
practicing in Vietnam, mainly farm, um, large farm is a software. Uh, someone uh, breeding household most uh, is available, traditional. And um, climate urea and lamb straw to feed the skin. Uh, but also green, uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emission. The number of gender cattle farmer and technical staff uh, is uh, limited uh, knowledge about the uh, necessary to grow these techniques to promote the uh, request uh, why uh, media channel consider a longer duration for training workshop promotes uh, promote uh, a green uh, emission reducing along with uh, financial economic benefits gained from brushing is a technique encourage the uh, engagement and highlight to run a participant in greenhouse gas uh, reduction. Thank you for your attention. Well, Mrs. Huong, thank you very much. Um, for me, this sounds like a very progressive project because you are not talking about developing knowledge, but you are already in the stage of disseminating knowledge about greenhouse gas reduction to farmers and to trainers. So this is a, a wonderful project. Thank you for sharing your experiences with this project. Our next speaker is my co colleague, Marion de Vries, who will share with us experiences about her project in Indonesia. Go ahead, I'm Marion. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. <laughs> After, yes, I guess we got rid of the background noise. I guess, uh, please try again, Marion. Yes, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. Um, my name is Marion de Vries. I'm a livestock scientist at Wageningen Livestock Research. And I'm very pleased that I can share today our experiences in Indonesia. Um, where we explored feeding and manure management strategies for the for greenhouse gas mitigation in the dairy sector. So Indonesia is uh, one of the most... Marion, uh, just mind me, would you be able to share uh, your screen? Voila, perfect, thank you. Yeah, can you see? Yeah, it's perfect, thank you very much. Okay, so Indonesia is one of the most populous countries in the world uh, and most of the humans as well, of, as well as the dairy cows live on the island Java. So Java is a very uh, densely populated island, uh, in both in terms of humans and, and, uh, and livestock. Um, the current demand for dairy uh, in, in Indonesia is not, not yet that high, but it's quickly rising because of uh, increased dairy uh, consumption. So if, if you have problems with internet connection, uh, please, please let me know because it says the internet connection is unstable. Um, so the demand in Indonesia is quickly rising because of uh, increased dairy consumption uh, patterns. But also the government of Indonesia has an ambition to uh, more than double the domestic uh, milk production in the Indonesia. And Indonesia wants to do that by uh, increases in the cattle population and also in productivity. So this is obviously a relation to uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the, from the dairy sector in Indonesia, which are currently still relatively low, but um, uh, are uh, steadily increasing because of, uh, of these ambitions and developments. Well, most of the milk in Indonesia is uh, still produced by smallholder uh, dairy farms um, with a, um, a relatively low productivity uh, per cow and, and uh, a poorer um, technical performance on uh, those farms compared to the larger farms. Um, and also uh, because of the high pressure on land, in Java, most of these dairy farms own, own only little uh, or small areas of land, which are often also located far away from the uh, dairy farms. 
So this disconnection of land and animals on these farms are causing uh, two main problems, uh, which is first of all a, a, a difficulty to obtain sufficient green fodder, uh, particularly in the, in the dry season uh, uh, when forage is scarce. And also uh, it is because of the disconnection of land and animals, it's, it's difficult to apply the manure on land for uh, forage production. So for the Indonesian dairy sector, we identified two uh, key sustainability issues, which is uh, first of all uh, uh, relates to uh, what Pierre Gerber explained previously, that actually the herd productivity and in, in efficiency is uh, suboptimal. And that is uh, on the one hand causing a low uh, milk and meat output, uh, obviously, uh, but also uh, causes relatively high greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of milk uh, in, in Indonesia. Uh, besides that, also uh, the resource efficiency uh, is, is low in, uh, in terms of feed use and nutrient use and also land use. So the second uh, uh, key sustainability issue we identified is that uh, most of the dairy farms, because of the disconnection between lands and animals, uh, are discharging manure into the environment. In, in West Java, that is uh, about estimated um, at about 60 to 90 percent of the dairy farms discharging the manure. And those farms that are applying uh, manure on land uh, close to the barn, um, often apply too much manure, which is causing overfertilization and consequently nitrous oxide emissions uh, uh, occurring from, from, these, um, from fertilization. So this is causing uh, especially problems with the pollution of local ecosystems and, and drinking water sources uh, and biodiversity losses uh, consequently, uh, but also increases in greenhouse gas emissions. This is particularly due to the overfertilization. And uh, uh, locally, this is considered uh, uh, problematic due to uh, local nuisance. Well, we estimated uh, greenhouse gas emissions of uh, 300 dairy farms in, in West Java in our uh, research, um, uh, which are plotted here on the y-axis. You see the um, emission intensity uh, in greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of milk and on the x-axis the milk yield, the average milk yield of on those farms. Um, uh, and we found that almost 60% uh, of the variation in uh, greenhouse gas emission intensity can be explained by the milk yield level uh, with much higher emission intensities at the lower end of the milk yield range. Um, so that means that milk yield is indeed an effective strategy in Indonesia to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, um, emissions per kilogram of, uh, of milk produced. So we found what is causing the differences between the high and the low uh, milk yield farms, that uh, low milk yield farms were more often mixed farms, whereas uh, farms with higher milk yields were more often specialized farms and they differed in uh, feed ration composition. And also, uh, interestingly, the higher milk yield farms uh, applied less manure and discharged more manure. So and in the next step, we piloted uh, uh, several uh, locally suitable uh, feeding and manure management interventions on 18 small-scale dairy farms uh, in almost uh, two years of time. And uh, that included for feeding interventions, improved water supply by uh, installing an improved feed of water trough, mineral supplementation, uh, introducing a higher quality compound concentrate feed, uh, balanced rations, um, new forage species we explored and uh, fodder conservation for the dry season. And for manure management uh, interventions, we, um, with those farms, we explored the shifting from discharging, uh, the current discharging and overfertilization of manure uh, to different types of uh, solid manures that could be transported uh, to other locations and application on forage or sills to, to horticulture. Well, I don't have the time to go uh, through to discuss all of them, but I will uh, explain results of uh, two uh, of these interventions, um, the compound concentrate feed and, and manure management interventions. So uh, in the project, uh, we developed uh, together with the feed comp a large uh, feed company, uh, an, an improved type of uh, uh, compound feed 
which contained a higher energy and protein content uh, and also contained an, uh, a higher quality um, mineral and vitamin premix. Um, so we have tested this at uh, 31 cows in mid-lactation and the hypothesis was that it, this would increase milk yield per cow and also improve the reproduction of those cows and the health. Um, well, indeed, from our, um, from our pilot, we found that uh, milk yields increased significantly by uh, 0 0.7 kilograms per cow per day. And um, we also expect that this could be even higher uh, when also cows in early lactation would be included and when they would be monitored for a longer period of time because we didn't include effects on, on reproduction and health yet. Um, but on the other hand, we also found that the uh, greenhouse gas emission intensity of, on those farms uh, increased. Uh, rather than decreased. And this was because uh, it processing emissions uh, increased and also there were higher end losses from manure, which um, were emitted as, as nitrous oxide during fertilization. Um, so if these uh, increased greenhouse gas emissions uh, from processing uh, feed and, and, um, and fertilization would not have occurred, occurred we would have uh, reached a, a reduction of 5 to 10 percent. Um, uh, Uh, potentially. So um, another example is the improvement of manure management on the farms. So we introduced uh, composting and vermicomposting on 11 uh, dairy farms, uh, which was sold or applied on own land for food crop production. And then that decreased significantly the amount of phases that were discharged. And also less manure was applied on land, causing less overfertilization. And that led to uh, an average of 4% um, lower greenhouse gas emissions from those dairy farms, uh, particularly due, due to the lower um, overfertilization, which is causing nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, but uh, as important is, are also the synergies with all other environmental impacts, uh, the pollution of uh, local ecosystems, drinking water sources and biodiversity nuisance. So in the in the next step in a new project, actually, we are uh, also looking at the effects of improved manure management outside the dairy sector, and also um, uh, looking at what happens if um, the discharged uh, previously discharged phases are replacing uh, urea in forage production in the dairy sector and uh, replacing uh, chicken manure in the horticultural sector. And then we find actually, uh, when we look at the whole manure value chain, that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are significantly reduced um, by 30 to 50 percent per ton of previously discharged phases. So to conclude, um, what what I would what I explained is that actually we saw that increasing milk yield through improved feeding can reduce greenhouse gas emission intensities, but we have to be aware of uh, potential trade-offs. So it's important to use an LCA uh, approach and yeah, life cycle assessment approach uh, to uh, discover if there's any increases in greenhouse gas emissions elsewhere in the dairy value chain. And also we have to take into account uh, other in environmental impact categories, uh, such as um, uh, local ecosystem pollution by the land use, and food feed competition. For feeding, there's also a number of, of what we call uh, no regret options, and uh, those are mostly focused on improving the efficiency of the use of current feed resources. For example, balanced rations, um, improvements in health and reproduction, or forage and crop, better forage and crop management. For manure uh, recycling, uh, we actually found that there's uh, synergies for most of the environmental impact categories. Yeah? So, so that is uh, uh, positive for most environmental aspects. But uh, for manure recycling, there's few incentives for farmers to start recycling manure because it's often not profitable. So that highlights also that uh, we have to look for uh, cost-effective manure management options um, yeah, for the dairy sector, but also uh, to look at application in other agricultural sectors in Indonesia. Um, and the last uh, point I would like to highlight that there is also in Indonesia a development, uh, rapidly de rapid development towards large-scale dairy farming, 
um, which also needs to be guided um, because that is where the last, largest increases uh, um, in uh, uh, milk production take place. So if you'd like to know more about the results of this project, here's a link to, uh, to our website and I would like to thank you for your attention. Marion, thank you very much for uh, presenting so many uh, in-depth experiences and research results, mainly about uh, manure interventions and feeding interventions. Thanks, and I, re I remember or I realized that we may give our presenters a little bit of hard time by offering only a time slot of 10 minutes. So please, also my question to the next speakers, next to offering a lot of information, please try to stick within your time slot of 10 minutes. Our next speaker will be Mr. Sridhar from the National Dairy Development Board of India. Mr. Sridhar, please share your experiences. You are still muted. Please unmute so we can hear you. Come. Yes, you are unmuted. You yeah. can start. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible to all of you? Looks good. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Is my screen visible to you? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so I have 10 minutes time. I'll try to stick to this time. Uh, I'll be sharing with you the experience that we have had in India in uh, GHG mitigation and uh, I'll also refer to the ration balancing program that the other speakers have uh, referred to in passing. Uh, okay, uh, the dairy farming system in India is much like the other uh, Asian nations, wherein you have a large number of farmers and 86% of the farmers are small and marginal. The land holding is uh, very less. So that's a challenge for uh, fodder production. And uh, you have a large, large number of uh, bovines. Um, the land, uh, the herd size per farmer is uh, ranging from one to four. So uh, this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity and I'll discuss about it a little later. Uh, so you know, what are the measures that we have been taking uh, at the National Dairy Development Board to uh, mitigate methane emissions? Uh, four principal measures. One is feeding. Uh, the second uh, is uh, manure management. Uh, the third is um, going for green energy. And the fourth, uh, which is on the top of your screens, is uh, incorporation of crop residues into the feeding systems so that we can avoid the burning of these crop residues. Uh, NDDB has uh, piloted one of the biggest um, developmental initiatives uh, with regard to feeding in this uh, part of the world. Um, uh, with the, this was a World Bank assisted project which ran for about seven years. Uh, we reached about 2.8 million uh, lactating animals uh, belonging to 2.2 million farmers in 18 states of India. And uh, this uh, program offered balanced rations to the animals and uh, the quality of milk went up, the quantity of milk went up and the net income to the farmers also went up. And uh, we were happy to note that there was a 13.7% reduction in enteric methane, methane emissions from the lactating animals. So the estimate was that about 545,000 tons of power, carbon dioxide equivalents of GAGs have been mitigated. Now taking the uh, concept of the ration balancing program forward, the aim is to reach more and more animals. So we have um, come out with a uh, program wherein we make um, the total mixed ration dry pellets. Uh, so uh, this is basically the and, uh, balanced uh, nutrients in the form of a pellet that you can see there. And these also contain crop residues to the extent of 10 to 15%. Uh, 
and uh, we have run extensive uh, studies uh, by feeding of the tmr uh, pellets to the uh, buffaloes and also to the cattle and uh, we have seen an increase in milk yield by 19% over the lactation uh, we have also seen a reduction in intercalving period and a reduction in enteric methane emissions by 11% uh, per kg milk uh, the national dairy development board of india Uh, has assisted two states for the setting up of uh, two uh, total mixed ration dry plants and these are as of today they are uh, operational and they have been uh, manufacturing about 8000 tons of pellets over the past two years so this was uh, an experience wherein we customized the delivery of balanced ration uh, manufactured centrally and distributed over a large area so that we can offer balanced ration at the doorsteps of the dairy farmers um, in a cost effective fashion uh, the second initiative uh, to reduce the um, uh, ghg emissions from dairying was the manure management initiative and uh, we have also um, uh, been scaling up this initiative uh, more than 2000 household level biogas uh, flexi biogas plants have been installed uh this is basically an inflatable uh, balloon sort of a plant uh, very easy to install uh, capacity of 2 cubic meters per day and um, can be installed in a span of 2 hours time uh, uh so mm, this has been uh, done in 2000 households and uh, we have also uh, established a biogas owner women's cooperative so the ladies of the household uh, have come together to form a cooperative and they are the people who manage the entire operations of the cooperative and the biogas that is generated is used for household cooking purposes it replaces the lpg gas that the household was using and uh, the slurry that results from this uh, biogas unit is used for the making of bio fertilizer so this is organic fertilizer and it can um, go a long way in boosting the fertility and replacing the chemical fertilizers the next initiative uh, a very important initiative again is the use of solar energy uh, in the dairy plants uh, also in the dairy farms uh, wherein you, you install the solar panels uh, and you the the energy generated can be used for uh, pumping of water for growing fodder on the farm and uh, uh, the concentrated solar thermal unit that is installed in the dairy processing plants can uh, uh, be used for the production of hot water which is used for um, clean in place techniques uh, which can be used in uh, other cleaning um, operations in the plants so all this um, minimizes the use of uh, conventional fossil fuels so uh, this is a peek into the future plans that we have uh, and which we are going to roll out as a package so that we get the benefit of synergized working uh, one is the crop residue management that is spoke about the second is the feeding of balanced rations through the medium of the total mixed ration pellets and also uh, we have um, uh, we have come out with a uh, app uh, which can be downloaded uh, free of cost from google play store it's called the e gopala app uh, it's an android based app and this can be used by the educated farmers to balance their own rations on their farms uh, manure management will continue to be a very significant initiative uh, then uh, we would uh, maximize the use of organic fertilizers and also uh, 